so yeah welcome to the uh to the meeting this is one of our regular monthly meetings and today we are uh hosting play we'll be talking about the ethics of autonomous vehicles which is a follow-up from a, a previous talk uh firstly i'd like to apologize if anyone is expecting the agm and brighton student presentations uh we're very sorry but due to um factors beyond our control that's going to happen next month uh and i will be uh, i will trailer that at the end of uh at the end of the show but uh, that will be on our next regular slot at wednesday the 10th of november so um yeah uh, very sorry if that's what you attended but i'm um, i'm very much looking forward to uh to having lay um join us um if you are still interested though in uh, before we uh, begin the um before we actually host the agm it's a very good opportunity to volunteer uh we are looking for new com committee members and you can send express any interest or ask any questions to sussex-chair at bcs.org sussex-chair at bcs.org if you are at all interested in being a committee member and joining the many of us who do um so yeah that's great uh, and what i will do now is i will hand over to uh blay so yeah welcome and thank you very much for, for the talk um before we begin, actually, Blay, how would you like to handle questions if there are any? Would you like people to ask during the uh, during your talk, or would you like some no, time? I'll, I'll, I'll rush through and take questions at the end. I mean, I I don't mind if people go away with questions in their head because I don't have a great set of answers for this. <laughs> uh, in fact, I'll give an advance warning that it, that one of my take home messages is that the ethicists have not done particularly well. Um, so I'm, I'm, in a way, I'm criticising my own profession uh, on this particular subject, uh, and I'll I'll explain why. Actually, <laughs> excellent. Well, uh, yeah, thank you very much. I, well, I, personally, I view uh, being able to be critical of uh, of your uh, practice as uh, part of professional competence. So I think that's a uh, okay. that's a really healthy thing to be able to have. Uh, <laughs> and uh, yeah. So, okay, uh, so in that case, yes, if anyone does want to ask questions, we'll, we'll have a chance to discuss and, and ask questions. And, and again, put something in the chat. <coughs> if I can't be heard, then maybe Matthew will interrupt me. Brilliant, um, yes, if there's anything really, uh, yeah, really important. Okay, lovely. Uh, in that case, would you like to go ahead and share your screen, Blay, and we can, uh, we can begin the talk? Um, okay, uh, I assume everyone can see the slides and all this is working well. Uh, the first thing to say is my um, abstract was not uh, really a boast. In August 2009, I had to look it up, I was uh, part of uh, a small group uh, at the uh, Institute, sorry, the uh, the Royal Academy of Engineering. And in fact, uh, I should report on this at length, uh, well, um, in a couple of sentences, because I was representing BCS at that meeting. Uh, and the, uh, the Royal Academy of Engineering wanted to look at some near to market technologies and look at the social, legal and ethical implications. I was not there as an expert on autonomous vehicles, but I started my learning journey in that meeting because we discussed autonomous vehicles at length. Uh, the first thing I have to report to you is that um, the manufacturers of vehicles, and there was a, a, a large uh, British named, if not owned, uh, manufacturer there and another multinational manufacturer, they said the, technolog the technological problems are solved. We have solved all the technical problems. Now it's over to you. And I report this not to assert that the technical problems are solved, uh, merely to tell you the attitude of the manufacturers. Uh, and so it was, a, we, we spent a lot of time discussing public acceptance uh, and governmental acceptance too. Um, one question we asked at length, which puts it in historical concept is, why would Gordon Brown go for this? That's how long ago it was. Gordon Brown was prime minister. What is in it for the government? Maybe uh, road safety is not a strong enough argument for the government. Uh, and I'll just wave a flag. Things have changed. We now have a government that's uh, very short of drivers. So that's one possible thing that's changed since that meeting. Um, but uh, 
that was the attitude of the manufacturers. And when I questioned this, their attitude was, come with me to the test track play. I'll show you. We have solved the problem of driverless cars. What we need now is to talk about acceptance. We discussed acceptance in great detail. We talked about the Clarkson effect, and that was named after Jeremy Clarkson, who was a, 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 back in 2009 was a motoring journalist uh, and um, a, a strong advocate of people driving their own cars, often at least in print, in a fairly reckless manner. Uh, and the problems of mixing autonomous vehicles with uh, human-driven vehicles in the fleet. I left that meeting thinking, uh, this is not going to happen in Britain. Uh, we had a representative, a nice lady from the Highways Authority, when we asked for a section of motorway to be all autonomous, we were told no, no way. Even in 2009, all sections of motorway in Britain were overloaded to at least 150%, some rather more than that. No one was going to build any more motorways, so we couldn't have any motorway, basically. Uh, and I left that thinking it's going to happen in China or France where they can build a new motorway. Uh, but uh, it was up to the ethicists to um, improve this, make it publicly acceptable and so on. And uh, as I said before the talk, I don't think the ethicists have done very well uh, on getting public acceptance for autonomous vehicles. Um, in, in fact, I'd say they've distracted themselves. And the reason for this is really quite simple. Um, most of them uh, have studied moral philosophy and philosophy undergraduates spend at least a term, maybe longer, with a runaway tram um, and uh, the so-called trolley problem. And uh, <laughs> autonomous vehicles have been rephrased by various people as an expression of the trolley problem. Uh, and assuming that you didn't spend a whole term with this wretched runaway tram like I did, I'm going to have to briefly explain uh, how it comes about. And it's, it works like this. Way back in 1967, a philosopher, an Oxford philosopher called Philippa Foote, in a paper called The Problem of Abortion and the Doctrine of Double Effect, proposed a number of thought experiments. This is a paper about abortion. Uh, and her opponent in the paper really is the Roman Catholic Church and their in-house philosopher, uh, <coughs> Tommy, well, Tommy to me, uh, St. Thomas Aquinas, to give him his full title, and the Doctrine of Double Effect, uh, which draws uh, an important moral distinction between killing someone and letting someone die. And Foote proposed in that paper a number of thought experiments to show that the actual division between letting someone die and killing someone is not all that clear cut. The one that's become famous is the so-called trolley problem. Um, I'll tell you why it's called the trolley problem on the next slide. Um, what uh, Philippa Foote actually says, if you remember my last slide, was we can suppose that he's the driver of a runaway tram, which he can steer from one narrow track to the other. So this is the problem. You're the driver of a tram, the brakes have failed. If you do nothing, the tram will run over and presumably kill five people, all strangers to you. Um, uh, or you can steer it um, if you're interested. Uh, back in 1967, pe people steered trams by going through a, a, a section of track with the power on or the power off. Now it's all done with nice hackable transponders, of course. Um, uh, but you can, you have the option to steer onto another track and kill one person instead of the five. Uh, and the, the crucial thing to say about this problem and the reason why philosophy undergraduates spend so much time talking about it is there's no right answer. And if you think, oh, it's obvious. Uh, no, if I was doing this live, I'd say, can I have a show of hands? How many people would change track? Uh, and people seeing the problem for the first time say, oh yeah, it's obvious you change track uh, and, and kill one person instead of five. Um, unless you're a, a devout Catholic, because that's a sin of commission rather than a sin of omission. And I should probably point out, if you're thinking it's just obvious that you switch tracks, that um, what you're doing is taking a decision to, <laughs> to bring about the death of an innocent person in cold blood, and that is clearly murder under UK law and most other countries' law. 
uh, so legally you might feel bound to do nothing. And if you say, well, okay, the law, the law's a bit of an ass on this. Morally, it's always better to kill one person than five. Then I'd have to say, if you say minimizing deaths is an important moral objective, then that would probably mean you believe that the Royal Sussex Hospital should be closed completely so the doctors and nurses can go to Chad or somewhere where they would save at least five times as many lives as they do in affluent Brighton. Um, so, you know, they, you don't go into ethics if you think there are easy answers to questions. You go into ethics because you like a challenge. Uh, and that's the reason this one can be talked about so much. The reason it's become famous um, is that <coughs> Judith, the JJ there stands for Judith Jarvis Thompson, um, who was a, a Harvard law professor. Uh, and because she was American and because Americans don't really know their trams from their trolleys, she renamed it the trolley problem uh, and uh, took Foote's case. Uh, she thought that because uh, you might feel you have special moral duties or special responsibilities as a driver, she would make it what's called the, the bystander version, where you just stand by the track and you happen to see this, this runaway tram and you can simply turn a switch and send it down either track. Now, um, it's interesting that most people would switch the, the tram, um, or, although Elizabeth Anscombe, and I hope you see what I'm showing with gender here, Elizabeth Anscombe in a reply to uh, Foote's original paper, Anscombe being, uh, or being at the time in the 60s, the most prominent Roman Catholic philosopher said, uh, you know, didn't actually confront foot head on, but she said, the driver of the tram would have done nothing wrong if he chose not to switch, uh, which is an interesting way of putting it. Um, uh, well, there's, there's, it's now become, uh, there's so much stuff uh, on the, the tram problem. You can see why when autonomous vehicles came around, the, the moral philosophers grabbed this with relish and wanted to talk about it um, and, and simply, instead of the tram driver, now we have computer code that must decide who to kill. Uh, it's even been discussed on Top Gear, right, in the autonomous vehicles context. Um, there's at least seven standard variations. Uh, the most important standard variation, because um, a lot of these things make difference, which I'll just, because in case you're finding it interesting to think about these things, uh, we've had to have a more politically correct name for it. It's now called Footbridge, uh, the, uh, or the or the bridge version of the trolley problem, where you imagine that you're standing on a footbridge over the track with a very large individual. And <clears throat> this individual is so large that if you push them off the bridge in front of the tram, they will stop it and save five people, uh, which is <clears throat> slightly different or <clears throat> kind of technically different from switch, but whether or not it's morally different, people are much more reluctant to actually throw someone in front of the tram than they are to simply pull a switch, even though the consequences are the same. So that's why it's of interest to psychologists as well as philosophers, because <laughs> the, the decisions people take on this are not uh, as, as simple as counting lives. And, and what's good about trolley problems is they are just about numbers. It, it's, we've got rid of all, people want to discuss whether or not your family are involved or important people or evil people, but that's not the point of the trolley problem. Trolley problems are, are normally configured as being just a choice of numbers, one and five in Foote's original paper. Um, my view, uh, and, and Again, I hope you see what's it is, is best in a, a paper for the uh, Brookings Institute in 2018 by Heather Roth. Um, and she basically says, as I'm saying, this is a complete distraction. In, in fact, what I'd say to engineers, it, and it's really important because I teach ethics to engineers and so on. And what I'd say to programmers as well is really quite simple. You know, it is not your job to go solving insoluble uh, problems in moral philosophy. <laughs> if you've got fixed the brakes on the tram in the first place, we wouldn't be in this mess. You know, it's your job to make your technology work as well as possible. That's your ethical responsibility. 
Right? And if you've done a shoddy job, that's how that's how we've got into this problem in the first place. You don't have to agree with me, but I, but but this is very much what what Heather Roth says, um, and I think it, this is a complete distraction. It's a, it's a very strong distraction. You shouldn't be making uh, autonomous vehicles that you know are dangerous, but on the other hand, you don't have to solve what I, I think it's fair to say is more or less an insoluble problem. Um, but nonetheless, that hasn't stopped much more work on it. An important psychological paper uh, is by this, uh, this group led by Bernard Maurer and Matthias Schultz, who are actually working on trying to program moral robots. Uh, and this uh, particular study I've got referenced here that you could look at was uh, uh, just a, basically an online questionnaire. And the bottom line from that study is people expect different standards from an autonomous system than they do for humans. So for humans, they're, they're much more tolerant of, the, of a human driver doing nothing and killing the five, but they would expect an autonomous system to switch and kill the one every time. Um, even harsher is a, a, a philosopher called Patrick Lynn, and I've actually collaborated with him on a number of projects. He's a, you know, a, a very thoughtful guy. And he, in a, in a piece for The Atlantic, he said, um, a, a human driver would have to take the decision in a split second. We can forgive them getting it wrong. But a team of software designers have got as long as it takes to get this right. Therefore, they should get it right. Um, so it's placing an even harsher burden on autonomous vehicles. Um, and I, again, I, you know, I can only echo Heather Rothenson. If, if the ethicists have, instead of telling you what's a good design, and, and I mean good in the moral sense or a bad design, have thrown you into trying to solve um, a problem that, that we know is more or less insoluble, then we really haven't helped. Um, it, maybe you think ethicists shouldn't help, but uh, we really haven't helped if that's how uh, we're going. Uh, even worse, well, well, yeah, I mean, just another example of how trying to help uh, an ethicist has actually muddied the waters even more. Um, uh, MIT, the Massachusetts Institute of Technology, put, on, put up an online survey called the Moral Machine. And this essentially just records people's choices in a massive survey, you know, in the form of a, of a, of a game style interface as to what they would do in uh, trolley situations. And I think I have a picture uh, on the next page. You see, what should the self-driving car do? Should it... <coughs> kill this pedestrian on the crossing, who happens, I think, to be female, or should it swerve into this barrier, killing the occupants of the car? And uh, there's a, a run of these choices, uh, a, a 20 odd, I think, with various combinations of uh, choosing who dies. Uh, and eventually they sum up all their work. Uh, and, and they've finally published uh, uh, the results of this big survey um, and their, their result paper or the, the philosophical paper that came out of the moral machine survey at MIT said, given that there are geographic variations and, and there are geographic variations, they're not spectacularly large and it probably wouldn't come um, uh, as a surprise to anyone to hear that that in East Asia, old people are valued more highly than young people, and the opposite is true of Europe. Um, they're, they're not spectacular differences, but there are differences between various parts of the world. They conclude from that, that uh, if we're going to have driverless cars, their, their choices about who should die in certain situations should be different for different parts of the world. Um, and I'm particularly unhappy about that. Uh, you don't have to agree uh, because, and it raises some deep philosophical questions about where does morality come from and so on. Uh, but uh, saying different solutions are appropriate for different parts of the world, 
particularly over matters of life and death, is affirming another moral principle which uh, I'm not prepared to affirm, namely, one should take one's moral values from the community around you. Uh, and that's, well, that would be the justification that any teenage drug dealer would give, you know, on this estate, uh, all my, uh, everyone like me is dealing drugs. Therefore, you know, not only uh, uh, it, would it be normal and uh, socially appropriate for me to deal drugs, but it would also be morally right for me to deal drugs. And I, I don't think that follows at all. Um, now, admittedly, the opposite view says, well, that means there is one right thing for all places in the world, and that raises all sorts of other difficulties. And again, this is another rabbit hole, which uh, and, and if you expect this one to be solved before there are automated vehicles on the roads, uh, well, I don't think it will be. It really is quite a rabbit hole. And if you ask me my view, uh, because you might in the questions, I mean, please don't, but if, if you do ask me my view in the question, I'm going to give the standard ethicist answer, it all depends. Right? Uh, for some things, it may be quite appropriate to make it culturally, culturally relative, but for who should die and who should live, there are immense dangers in making that culturally relative. That's, that's not a good direction in which to head. So I, I'm not that impressed by MIT. Um, also, I'm not sure that moral questions are answered by democracy. Um, maybe some, but uh, yeah, I'm not sure. So that's a further problem. Um, that's what I've just said, isn't it? Uh, I don't I don't believe I meant to do that. Um, I, I don't think one should always, the key word there being always, accept the ethics of the people around you. It's quite possible that you may find yourself in a society where bad things are normal, in which case uh, you might want to reject them. Uh, and as I'm going to say later, I feel uh, it's it's pretty pointless to have national solutions to these problems uh, with autonomous vehicles because we now live in a world where uh, software travels at the click of a mouse all over the world uh, and an AI system or <laughs> even something hard coded uh, in one country it doesn't stay in that country. The idea that we don't well. It's my personal view. You don't have to agree. It's my personal view that we need global solutions and we're wasting our time if we're not talking global solutions because the world is networked now. Uh, and, and for sure, autonomous vehicles will be networked globally and probably imported from the other side of the world. Uh, I also feel that in concentrating on something that they all enjoyed as an undergraduate, namely the runaway tram, uh, that uh, the ethicists have avoided posing the big questions, uh, which I'm now going to pose now. Uh, I, I don't think there are easy answers, but <laughs> these are the biggest of the big questions. Right? What sort of autonomous vehicles do we want? Uh, and, and the knee-jerk reaction is, well, we want, with, in any automated system, it should be exactly like the human system that it replaces. Well, maybe, maybe not. You need to dig before that. And whose fault is it if something, well, when something goes wrong, because we know that, that things will go wrong in the real world. Uh, the uh, acronym at the bottom stands for this is not an exhaustive list. It's a Whitbyism, and it's going to occur on the next, a lot of the next slides. I don't claim to have covered all the big questions there. It's just two that I've thought of. Um, so what sort of autonomous vehicles do we want? Well, what standards are we aiming for? Right? Uh, as good or, or as bad as human drivers? Um, and human drivers, well, human drivers are pretty average, actually. Um, they they kill a lot of people through getting it wrong. Um, and <clears throat> one of the best ways to get it wrong is to imbibe alcohol. And that's still the major cause of road deaths in Britain and most other countries. 
um, or, or countries with a reasonable road safety record um, because it deteriorates human performance. Interesting, um, but true. Uh, are, are measurably better than human performance, right? <laughs> near perfect or perfect. Um, and a lot of people, and, I, and again, I'll point the finger at journalists here. A lot of people are going to scream perfect. I mean, it's worth mentioning at this point that Uber had a fatal accident in an autonomous vehicle, um, which is well documented, and just dropped out of the autonomous vehicle game altogether at that point. Um, I've looked at the accident and particularly the video of what was seen at the time, and it would be a rare, it would be an exceptional human driver that would be able to avoid that accident. Uh, so saying, you know, the autonomous system should have avoided it is really quite unfair. Um, and again, uh, if, if you want perfect, we're going to need to think very hard about the entire system. It may be that, that uh, a zero casualty uh, on, on the road situation might mean uh, electric fences to keep pedestrians out the way uh, and, and, and considerable improvements and if you want that. Um, but you might just want better. Uh, but again, this is a choice. And, and maybe I'd be happy to have people discuss this uh, and really say, what standards do you want? And we'd certainly be happy to have people discuss it um, today. I, I mean, the manufacturers would all shout, we can, we can achieve near perfect. Some of them say they can achieve perfect, actually, but I think that's, that's self-deception because in, in engineering, in anything, you know, uh, you know it, it's like bug-free code. Yeah, people, people use this term, but, but we all know, don't we, that bug-free means we've found all the bugs we can be bothered to find. Um, and, and I think that that's how you should interpret perfect if it comes from a manufacturer. Uh, so how assertive, I mean, I should mention at this point um, that as I understand the current state of the art, if four Google cars arrive at a four way stop sign, so they all have to give way to each other, they will remain there until their batteries go flat because they are programmed to wait for the other vehicles. And so they will all wait. Um, and uh, yeah, as a technology ethicist, you know, I, I, mean, I can't say anything because I've signed lots of non disclosure agreements. And ethically, I'm not that happy with non disclosure agreements, but obviously, there are commercial secrets in this area. But you can imagine that a technology ethicist might be given this question, how assertive can we program an autonomous vehicle to be? Uh, and again, uh, how it, uh, this is one, here's a scale. I don't think that I've covered all the possibilities and you might want to discuss this scale. Uh, I've got a colleague, uh, a friend, and I've, oddly enough, seen him at the Flying Club occasionally, uh, and he, he's just retired as a computer science lecturer at Brighton University. I better not say any more before you start identifying him. But he said quite early on in this debate, he said, if I see a Google car, I'm going to cut it up because I know for sure it will give way. Uh, and yes, uh, you can really be sure of that. Uh, but if that's how, that's the sort of human behavior that autonomous vehicles are going to promote, then that's a problem. Uh, and it, it may also be a problem in that they, they are so unassertive that they can't actually operate in mixed traffic. Um, one way around that, again, I will point, is not to have any mixed traffic, uh, to have you know, autonomous vehicles only in certain areas. And a lot of people are, are thinking about that. It's difficult in Britain where we can't build any new roads, but that's, uh, that is one possibility. Um, but obviously we're going to have to think of a, a level of assertion and people haven't thought, um, people haven't thought this one through. The problem with the chat is it stops my slide advance. So on to the, the intriguing question. I think I've been publishing on this for, well, it seems like <laughs> two lifetimes, certainly since 1988. Who's, who uh, do we hold responsible when things go wrong? 
we have a model of responsibility, particularly for road accidents, which says we must single out humans. Um, and, and humans love it. Humans get annoyed if insurance companies say, well, it's 50-50, we'll have a knock for knock. No, no, they're, they're always sure that the other driver is to blame and quite prepared often to go to court pointlessly and expensively to get themselves out of blame. But maybe that's just a human characteristic. Um, commercial interests, again, have lots of good reason to avoid being blamed um, and do everything they can to avoid being blamed. Uh, but uh, if this is a question. I mean, I have a particular view on this, which is, is not popular. Um, but we could say, well, accidents happen. We're not going to apportion blame. Or we could say, uh, if you've done everything right, if the work you did on the brakes of the tram was up to the normal standards in the area, uh, what are the normal standards in the area? Well, let's bring in some engineers who'd say this is what we normally do. Um, and uh, Or, you know, I'm sorry, you're always responsible. Um, it, I mean, it's worth throwing in here, assuming that my, my audience has people who've been, uh, <coughs> spent a lot of time in the software, in or around the software industry, that it's rare for people to be held up in court for bad software, even if it's clearly caused an accident, um, even if it takes over control of an airliner and slams it into the ground, not once, but twice. It's very rare for programmers to be hauled up, very difficult to actually prosecute them, um, which yeah, maybe so, it's maybe something that BCS have a view on, because I think anyone who has spent any time in the software or IT industry knows that there, you know, there's good work and there's bad work and, there, and, a, and a lot in between. Um, and there's adequate testing, uh, good testing or, you know, frankly, inadequate testing. And it's not surprising that it all crashed. Um, you know, there, there are vast, you know, it, there, are, there is good and bad engineering in the software field and people who are in it can, uh, can make judgments about that. Um, but we need to sort this. And, and I think at this point also controversially, I'll, I'll, I'll make some more, um, I'll make some more enemies by saying I'd like to call Tesla out on this one because I think they've done a very unethical thing. The Tesla autopilot is a pretty good state of the art um, autonomous vehicle technology, provided it's on a freeway in reasonable light. Um, it can maintain the speed and safe distance from vehicles in other lanes, keep you in the lane and deal with people uh, changing lane in front of you and so on. Uh, although admittedly that technology is generally in cars now. Um, it's, it's, it's not groundbreaking. But what Tesla say is you must uh, keep your hands on the steering wheel, remain ready to take over if it messes up. And you will uh, perhaps have read Tesla have had a, a few fables where it has messed up. Um, and in that case, they can blame the dead driver, you know, particularly if the dead driver was on the phone or playing a video game at the time. Um, and that's, that's a good way of handing out blame. Right? Uh, but really quite unfair, because one thing we know for sure is that humans cannot take over from an automated system in nanoseconds. In fact, uh, the the best example of just how dip, what what's known in aviation as the startle effect when an autopilot quits, uh, and we're talking there about people especially trained to do this, fit well, alert, and so on, and, and usually more than one of them on the flight deck. Um, the the startle effect is such that it may be quite some time before they can regain control of an aircraft when the autopilot suddenly quits. The best example, if you want to look it up, is Air France AF447, where the automatics quit, admittedly at 10 past two in the morning. Humans do not work well at 10 past two in the morning. Um, and they had maybe five or 10 minutes to regain control of this aircraft, but they completely failed and it went into the South Atlantic. Uh, so I, I put it to you if, you know, if trained airline pilots whose job is to do just that, 
can't take over control in five or 10 minutes. The average driver cannot take over control in 50 milliseconds or even 500 milliseconds. Um, so Tesla really are, are cheating by saying it's your fault when the autopilot quits. Um, I'm, I'm not sure how you can make that say. Uh, yeah, come on. I'm sorry, I, I can't get to my, no, I have to do this, I'm afraid. Uh, so, how good is it? Well, again, again, at how long is a piece of string? You must choose the estimates. Uh, General Motors say they've got a zero crashes goal. They think autonomous vehicles can remove 100% uh, of uh, road deaths. Uh, I mean, again, I suggested that this might be unrealistic thinking or publicity thinking. The uh, National Highway Traffic Safety Administration in the US thinks they can achieve 94%. But um, a consultant is this chap, Phil Koopman, was um, uh, he's a, an academic at, at Carnegie, uh, Carnegie Mellon University uh, was commissioned to look at this and he said uh, because they're <laughs> manipulating the figures in a specific way only a 25 percent reduction in road deaths would be achieved by getting humans out of it altogether. Um, my personal belief is that well, humans do cause most of most road deaths. However, the autonomous vehicles, particularly with the current state of the art, are far from perfect. Uh, I've got a problem here, haven't I? So, is the technology sorted? I don't think so. Um, um, and I'll tell you why I don't think so. It's because questions like, uh, I mean, calling in a technology ethicist to say, how assertive should we make these vehicles, suggests to me that you haven't completely sorted the technology. I don't think the, the ethical, the social and the legal questions come away from the technological questions in any meaningful sense. So saying, you know, oh, well, if the public accept it and there's no problem with human drivers and so on, then it can drive perfectly, just isn't good enough. I mean, it, it has to it has to work in the real world. And in the real world, there are these ethical questions uh, and they remain. Uh, so the, the technology isn't sorted. Some other things I could say, um, Google's technology relies a lot, as you would expect, on Google's mapping technology. Uh, and if there's been a, a recent change in the road, then it struggles to deal with that. Uh, LiDAR. Uh, because um, some manufacturers won't use radar. They're very sniffy about the, the sensor technology they use. LiDAR can't see through fog or rain very well. Admittedly, neither can humans. Um, but if you, if you have a commitment against radar and you have to use light-based technology, then there's limitations in that. Um, and a lot of these limitations are still being explored um, but it, it's pretty good, but it's not completely sorted in my view. Certainly, you know, if there was someone here uh, from a major motor manufacturer, they, they'd shout me down and say, what more do you want? We've sorted all the problems. But it, interesting to discuss. Um, it's also worth saying that uh, we're getting automated vehicles by stealth. Most modern cars, uh, they're legally required to have uh, brakes that won't skid. Lewis Hamilton can skid by pressing the brake pedal too hard, but you can't. You're not trusted to work the brakes. Uh, and it's a legal requirement in Britain that your car has uh, ABS. Um, and if it doesn't work, then your car's not considered safe. Uh, we also have lane keeping technology. We have um, uh, intelligent cruise control that maintains a safe distance from the vehicle in front. Uh, Certainly, my latest car, you can't even turn that off. 
So if you've got cruise control, then it's going to put the brakes on automatically when someone pulls in front of you. Uh, that's that's just too bad. Uh, so we're getting progressive automation. And, and of course, the best way to see this is to get into a classic car, to get into a car, uh, you know, from the last century and see just how much more work it expects you to do. You know, you need to th do an awful lot of thinking for the car, whereas modern cars uh, are getting more and more automated. I, I suppose I should also throw in uh, at this point, in case I forget later, uh, that the attitude of the government seems to me to have changed. Uh, and uh, one, of, one, of the, one of the things that's come out of, current, of government policy this year is if you can't find drivers, you should automate. If you can't find fruit pickers, you should automate. The pressure to automate is definitely on. Um, although having said that, I suspect the government really wants us to give up driving. Uh, and that could, that's uh, another motivation behind all this. Uh, but please don't quote me on that. That is not official policy, but I, I suspect that they hope that when they ban petrol and diesel cars and so on, uh, and electric cars remain expensive and fairly short in range, that people will simply stop driving. And if you say, well, will they go to public transport? No, that's not the government policy either. The government policy is everyone will stay home and play video games, or especially now we've discovered, uh, discovered in quotes that 50% of the people who commuted into London every day of the week, all day, didn't need to, um, which is an, an interesting discovery. But <laughs> taking all that on board, I think, um, and, and I, I should say I am speaking in one of the few parts of the world where car ownership is decreasing quite spectacularly. So you know, um, the idea that we will continue to drive at the same level, I don't think is part of government policy, but I've never heard anything official, so don't please don't quote me. But, <laughs> but that's the sort of attitude we're getting. Um, so what do I recommend to try and round things off here? Um, Okay, in spite of limitations, and you know, the technology has its limitations, um, and even more than the technology having limitations, I, I, I think sometimes the, the manufacturers uh, are not behaving in the best possible way. I, I mean, I've already criticized Tesla for saying we're going to hold the driver responsible for the inadequacies of our system. Um, uh, and, and that's not really the worst. Uh, the worst I can't really say because I've signed a non-disclosure agreement, but uh, uh, in spite of all this, we should introduce driverless cars as soon as practicable because that would reduce road casualties. So that my ethical case is that it would <laughs> reduce road casualties. And my estimate, and, and again, it, it's, a, a, it's a guess, and I've shown you several guesses over a wide range, but the thing is, Every guess, even of the wider range, doesn't say deaths will increase. It says deaths will reduce. It's just a question of just, the, the only question is how much. And I know that the press are going to, are going to be like Uber. They're going to go through the roof when, <laughs> when there is uh, an autonomous vehicle accident. And, and they're just, you know, the headlines, Google killed my granny, uh, are just, they're, they're there ready to go. I know this. But um, my view, again, is we should forget perfect and, and work to highest possible. Now, I admit the IT industry has often shied away from highest possible. And it is the, there seems to be a regrettable tendency to go for quickest possible or cheapest possible. Uh, and, you know, I, again, I've spent my career calling that out. Um, you know, <laughs> expecting the user to debug your software really isn't the most ethical way to behave. Um, and I know you'll say, yeah, but it's a competitive industry, Glenn, and that's how everyone else behaves. You know, we can't, we can't do higher standards than Microsoft, in which case I hear that argument I mentioned earlier, everybody else on the estate is dealing drugs, so I should as well. Uh, <clears throat> you don't have to agree with me, but that, that's what I hear. When I hear it's a competitive industry, we have to release buggy software too. No, you don't. Um, 
so again, I, I would estimate, I'm estimating a 90%, that's, that's on the high side. Um, but notice there, there still will be accidents. Uh, and you know, I'm citing a, an important moral principle here that the best is the enemy of the good. If we wait till perfection, we wait for perfection, well, A, we won't get it, and B, people are dying now, and we have, uh, we have a way to stop it, or at least reduce it, and any reduction is good enough to justify it, in my view. Uh, and here are some practical suggestions, right? Uh, worldwide legislation and um, approving standards is needed now. And of course, aviation is the uh, is my proof here. Is my uh, is my example case. Uh, in 1948, uh, about 27 countries got together in Chicago and uh, signed up to the International Civil Aviation Organization. Now, in 2021, every country in the world is in it, um, uh, with the exception of Liechtenstein, which is assumed to be covered, if you're, uh, if you're going to be pedantic and legal about it. So um, it is possible to get everyone to agree on standards. Uh, and you know, some of the things in civil aviation they they were quite tough. It wasn't that you know everybody said, oh yeah, obviously we need to to agree these standards, to agree standards of training, standards of li licensing, standards of maintenance. No, they said this is an interference with our commercial freedom. You know we should be able to do this differently. Um, uh, one country uh, has been vociferous and, uh, until the twenty first century. Uh, against one provision of the uh, the Treaty of Chicago in 1948, because because it said that uh, the international language of civil aviation would be English. One country took that very badly and fought and fought. Um, I'm sure you can guess which one, and it wasn't China. Um, but that's that's something. Um, uh, and also, what I've got down there, uh, no blame investigation. No blame investigation is one of the great innovations of the aviation industry, I think, or at least the public transport side uh, of the aviation industry. Uh, I teach a course called the Aviation Model in Medicine and really push this. And um, after uh, at least 20 years, people have started listening and we now have a medical accidents investigation branch chaired by an ex-chair of the air accident investigation branch, which does uh, <laughs> investigate medical accidents on a no blame basis and publish the results. That's important too. And that's why you can turn on your TV and watch dramas about aviation accidents because when the accident is investigated on a no blame basis, the results have to be published in English. It's a thorough investigation, no stone unturned. So it's an easy source of material. And it, it sounds very harsh, but what they would say in aviation is a secret accident is an accident that's going to happen again. And I think that uh, applies equally to driverless cars. It's got me shown the door uh, at certain manufacturers because I think to um, investigate uh, an accident for a driverless car I'm not, I can't be fobbed off with this. It's an AI system, it's inscrutable, which is what people are saying. And it's annoying the government quite a bit. Um, there's no way of, of working out why it did. I, I think there is a way of working out, but it's not a job for a journalist. It's not a job for a lawyer. It's not a job for a philosopher. It's a job for a techie, well, a team of techies. Um, uh, to work out and and they should have the same sort of access that's expected in aviation they should be able to breeze into the manufacturer and not only us to see the code but also us to interview the coders and to ask them questions like why did you do it this way uh how much did you test it did you test this case did you test that case um and and it, it's a techie job it, it's not it's not a job for journalists you know, it, it, you need to go deep into it. If you're really going to avoid that accident happening again, right? you need to you need to go into the details. Um, and that people will only help 
if they're not going to be prosecuted by opening their mouths. That's why it works so well in aviation. And there are no lawyers that are terribly upset by the idea of no blame investigation, um, because sometimes you know, <laughs> blame is necessary, particularly you know, <laughs> particularly if your relatives have been killed by someone's negligence. You know, you're not going to be happy with this no blame investigation. But it has worked very well in aviation. And if you do read, and again, they're all available online, any aviation accident report, there will be a paragraph on the front page saying, because this has been compiled with no view to apportion blame or responsibility, no portion of it can be used to apportion blame or responsibility. It's only our job to make recommendations. Now, I, uh, now this is difficult and uh, requires change of attitude, but I feel it would be possible in this area, and it's probably the ethical way forward. Yeah, I don't deny that it would be expensive because, as I said, you know, it's a job. It's a job for a team of techies, and they're they're going to need some pretty detailed knowledge of the software involved. Um, but I, you know, the idea that it's just done by some superficial look over the top, what would a human do in this situation, doesn't work for me. It, it, these are these are technical questions. These are deep technical questions, um, and. Of course, I, again, this is something that's not popular with certain manufacturers in this area. Um, and, uh, certain large AI companies with an interest in autonomous vehicles have very loudly said to me, no, our software is our intellectual property. No way is anyone outside the company ever going to look at it. Um, and I, I don't feel that's helpful. Um, but <laughs> as, that's the commercial pressure. And as I say at the bottom there, you don't have to agree. Uh, but these, these are my suggestions for how we should go forward. Um, it's, it's no good you know, saying because there's been an accident that, uh, sorry about this, you see the problem, I can't get to the button. Um, it's no good saying because, the, uh, because there's been an accident Therefore, your vehicle is unsafe, which was the Uber's response, actually. And uh, I, I think they overreacted there. They presumably thought bad publicity was not worth the, the effort. The, the research was just draining money. And if it was going to get them into trouble, then it, it wasn't worth it. Um, and I, I do think, you know, there needs to be uh, international agreement and government agreement and this, I mean, I, I should throw in, of course, that uh, I'm on the advisory panel of the all party, uh, all party parliamentary advisory group for AI. And probably three or four years ago now, we recommended that the UK should have a minister for AI at cabinet level. We, I, I wouldn't hold your breath for that happening um, because the, uh, we've been told that, you know, Basically, the brief for such a minister is owned by other ministries, and there's a lot of empire building goes on in government at that level. So uh, I, I doubt if it will happen. But my vision would be that such a minister would not, not tell the AI industry what to do, but the AI industry would say what they wanted, and the minister would go to international conferences and agree international agreements. Um, that would be my um, my view on uh, on this. Uh, so now I've talked for long enough. If you wanted to play the moral machine, maybe you've all been playing the moral machine instead of looking for me. But I, I didn't put the uh, I didn't put the reference or the results up yet. Um, and for anyone who has stuck with me all the way thank you for listening lovely thank you very much blay um really interesting really good lots of lots of conversation in the chat and uh lots of stuff so what i'd like to do is um we did start a little late so uh, normally what we do is we have uh formal questions and then we have um and then we have free discussion so what I'd like to do is give us maybe 10 minutes for formal questions that will, will be recorded, and then we'll close uh, for a kind of more informal discussion afterwards. So does anyone have any kind of more direct, specific questions about the talk 
that they would like to uh, share. Uh, either please unmute yourself and ask your question or uh, ask it in the chat and I can read it out. Uh, I've got a few questions, if that's OK. Um, yeah, if we could kind of, uh, if, if there's any kind of nice, succinct, fairly succinct ones before we can, we can discuss more broad stuff uh, in a little bit and there'll be time for that. Uh, sure, yeah, so I, I made some notes from the um, from the talk and a couple of things that specifically sprung out is um, certainly on the blame side and also on the um, the yeah, analytics of accidents. Um, one thing, so similar to aviation, they should have remaining in the car, even in any kind of accident, it should have the data of exactly what happened for analysing the accident. But also one thing that is easy to miss out on is, is the, the cars won't be giving any credit for accidents that they've avoided that a human would have been involved in. And I think that's, that's a very difficult thing to look at if you're looking for the improvement in, um, you know, in, in performance. A um, couple of other things, we were talking about you know whether you should you should implement this and whether you you know try and do this early get it done and then tesla has a obviously a different approach to this i think one of the the problems with um assigning blame in here is is how it's currently regulated i think tesla's currently regulated as a level two system so it, it's very difficult in that regime for them to to get the blame for that and and finally moving on to the um that the no blame that the kind of thing the way things work in in aviation and i spent 20 years in aviation insurance and air france indeed was one of my clients and uh, a lot of stuff happened in there i think there was a lot of stuff that happened in that particular incident that wasn't just the reaction to the autopilot kicking out it was you know major system failures and training failures and other things but also the um, the no blame side, yes, there's no blame. An individual programmer, maybe an individual pilot, wouldn't get the blame in the report. But then insurance gets involved and liabilities are are put in. Air France got massive punitive damages for that particular crash. So did Airbus. So did the component manufacturers. So it's it's not quite no blame in in that way. The, the report is no blame, but then the report is then used in the um, in, in the you know the actual awarding of damages and i feel that that would you know the similar kind of independent reporting but then that gets passed on to insurance to handle it's probably maybe a better way of looking at this so that's me done thank you lay do you want to uh, add anything or, or, or respond to anything? um I, I i agree i actually i think someone who makes a defective autonomous vehicle should face prosecution um it, I didn't mean that there should be no product liability. I meant simply that you shouldn't assume that because your autonomous vehicle had, has done something clearly clearly wrong or even killed someone, um, that uh, that's, that's entirely your fault. I, I think prosecution and uh, giving blame, like in aviation, is a separate matter. We need to know what's happened first. Um, and we don't know what's happened. You see, I've expressed a view about the Uber fatality, which is that, uh, well, I, I would hold them partially liable because there's, there were a number of errors in that. And again, the, uh, the software and the detectors aren't perfect. But the idea that, you know, they're entirely liable for a death is simplistic. And I've, I've, no, I've no problem with... Uh, this being the, the the problem is to you know to put it bluntly we we have an insurance model which is based on human drivers and we need to, we need to rethink that um, it, I'm not suggesting that you know anybody can make a, a a dud program and get away with it not that at all it, but simply that as in the aviation case we should work out what's happened before moving to prosecution does that um, I mean, have I answered this adequately? I mean, I, really, I agree with you. Um, yeah, no, absolutely. Okay. That, that's correct. And in the same sense as, you know, in, insurance in car driving is is geared towards human driving, in the aviation world, it was geared towards human pilots. But then when there were systems-induced errors, the, the accident investigation was perfectly capable of 
of addressing that and the insurance and the legal firm were capable of addressing that in the same way. I don't think there's inherently a problem in applying that the kind of, you know, the reasonable investigation approach and then leaving it to yeah, any subsequent litigation or injury. I think that should work exactly the same for driving. They, they may well be very high profile, but in the same way as, uh, as an airline that crashes in the North Sea, that's very high profile. It, it, it's just the same kind of approach. Yeah. Well, well I, I think we're in agreement about this. But, Absolutely. But there are many sticky institutional problems. I mean, the, the manufacturers say, we've done it, our, our cars are great. Uh, and the insurance companies say, why should we change a working formula? <laughs> it, the motor insurance industry works quite well. They, they've, they've dealt with a lot of it. So it really requires, I think, a push from the top for government to say, no, we, we're moving to a, a new model here. And, you know, you, you're going to have to assess claims on a slightly different basis. Or what, or what you've said, systems failures, because a lot of road accidents are systems failures. Um, yeah, and, and we're realising that now. But it's very hard, you know, you, 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 you know to say, uh, to drag the council in and say that sign shouldn't have been there or it should have been somewhere else. Um, it's, it's really quite interesting. Uh, because people want a single blame point and to prosecute single liability when there are systems failures. I think I'd like to just leave that as a point just to wrap the, the kind of formal part of the talk and we'll, I know we've got some more questions and I really want to discuss them but I just want to uh, close out the formal part of the meeting uh, before we do and so we can discuss off record and, and be a bit freer in our conversations as well. So um, thank you all very much for everyone who's attended and all of your questions and thank you very much Blay for speaking and for such a fascinating talk. We are going to have the uh, AGM and student presentations uh, I hope next, uh, next, next meeting which will be on Zoom at 7pm on Wednesday the 10th of November. Um, so please do join us then. Uh, as I mentioned before, um, if you are interested in being on the committee or want to find out more, uh, please do email sussex-chair at bcs.org for more information. Uh, and we'd be really grateful to, uh, to have a conversation with you and, and uh, find out more about what you might want to do in terms of volunteering. Um, I'm going to close the recording now and thank you all very much for watching.